Have you ever thought about the way any location goes from the very first draft? In fact, sometimes they get a bunch of corrections or even are remade from scratch. So today we are going to talk about the process of level design and instruments used by professional level designers. This video was written and recorded by Yuri Kulagin, translated to English by Nikita Volkovich and edited by Daria Kulagina Kravchuk. Let's start with the instruments of a typical level designer. Most of the locations are firstly drawn in paper, but very few of them can get through this stage. Sketches and drafts like these can be found in various art books, dev blogs or other media dedicated to game design. This chain of blocks, arrows, points and endless comments isn't just an actual map. It shows how a player interacts with the game. The next instrument is not as common as the previous one, but it is a must for professional level designers. Metrics. Here we need one more specialist, a game designer. Together with level designers, they develop metrics and templates. The idea is to create a set of rules instead of adding details randomly. Everything you can imagine on the location is controlled by metrics, from the width of pits to the shooting range of any single weapon you can find there. Metrics are also important for props size, otherwise a doghouse can accidentally turn into a full-scale building. When the metrics are ready, the level designer assembles a 3D layout called blockout. There are two types of them. Designer blockout, or so-called grey box, is used to checking out gameplay features. That's why here you can find only the things that directly impact the gameplay. Though the location now consists of grey cubes, planes and spheres, they are already made in accordance with metrics and scales. Here level designers test various mechanics like climbing or hiding, analyze the gameplay in general and its difficulty. If they realize that some element doesn't work properly, they remake it or cut out from the final version. After all the corrections, the prototype turns into art blockout, also known as white box. Boring grey drafts and primitive shapes are now replaced with colorful, fully detailed models. The creation of a level usually starts with planning. Here development's team decides on the role and place of the location in the final version of the game. The planning step is a perfect moment for a level designer to bring out his own ideas on the gameplay and story. After that, the team starts working on the dynamics of the level and its structure. Pacing regulates the heat of emotions at any single step of the walkthrough. The down bits are moments when a player can catch a breath and the up bits are needed to not get bored. There are three types of levels. In linear levels, all secondary paths return players to the main direction. That's for example how it works in Call of Duty Modern Warfare. The cluster type levels consist of a chain of hubs with numerous ways leading out of them. A good example of this structure is Resident Evil 2. And finally, the web type levels. They look like a complex of clusters. In this system, a player is free to move wherever he wants. This concept was used, for example, in Watch Dogs 2. The next stage of creating location is paperwork. When the concept, the structure and the pacing are done, a level designer puts his ideas down to paper. He makes the first draft of the location and marks the main stages of the walkthrough and player's objectives. Then he writes it down in project documents. The technical documentation allows us to describe all the surroundings and figure out their production time. This helps us to sum up the vision of the future level, the gameplay features and the details needed to assemble it. The next step is the creation of a playable prototype, also known as Blockout. It is the first chance for a level designer to actually play his creation. Blank forms without details are easy to move, add or erase. It's very handy for changing the level. If necessary, designers could even delete everything in one click and start from the very beginning. At this stage often happens the situation when some gameplay mechanics aren't yet ready to use. That's why level designers usually implement them step by step, keeping the level up to date. This step uses metrics that were made before to follow the proportions and scale of the level. Level designers make sure that the character will be able to climb all the needed cliffs and doesn't hit the ceiling with his head. An interesting fact, one simple room may require several dozens metrics in blockout. Ignoring the metrics can ruin the walkthrough and upset the player, especially if his character's head is clearly seen above a cover during the gunfight. After choosing the right metrics and scale, a level designer makes his level playable as soon as possible. This requires setting up all the necessary functions, cutscenes, event triggers, environment for artificial intelligence and so on. 
Then come gameplay tests, when designers study the testers' reaction and collect their feedback to figure out the most irritating factors. The new versions of the level are tested until all the critical problems are solved. At this step, the game engine is already stable enough to work with the camera. This is especially important for third-person games. Watching the walls, location borders and small objects not to block the camera is one of the designer's main duties. Sometimes interfering with walls and other stuff especially needed to make gamers feel claustrophobic. For example, in Dark Souls, a player often travels through narrow tunnels and catacombs pressing on him. The less space he has, the more difficult it is to move. In such cases, a camera turns into one more invisible element of game design. One more thing to consider is the limits of the game engine. Sometimes the technology cannot fulfill the fantasy of a creator, and that's why, to avoid those constraints, level designers and programmers often use special tricks. The most popular trick is called the bottleneck. We face these elements of the level regularly, but if they are made in the proper way, we simply don't notice them. Elevators in Mass Effect, narrow streets in The Last of Us, and any narrow passages in The Last Tomb Raider are made to slow us down and to give the system time to unload and download data. At the end of the stage, designers get the scheme of the level. When it's approved, any further development of the location stops, except for any special reasons. From there, the prototype can be only polished, but without major changes. The next step is the creation of the white box. When the basic blockout is done, level designers get down to the geometry prototype. Here starts the cooperation with environment and concept artists. As the scheme has already been approved, at this stage they are even more important than level designers. We can see there how the level evolves from its gameplay prototype till the final release version. Based on the gameplay prototype and temporary models, we create the white box. The environment artist left the prototype untouched and use all the needed artistic means to improve the navigation through the level. For example, they set up lighting, composition contrast and so on. The difference between types of blockouts and different development stages is perfectly illustrated in dev block dedicated to hidden in plain sight mission from Uncharted 4. Sometimes after detailing the surroundings the location becomes unplayable. For example, a placeholder chest or a tree might block a player's view, or they exit from the level. In such cases, level designers have to check the location one more time and to make sure that players can enjoy the gameplay without a hitch. Here the metrics will come in handy again. When the white box is finally working as intended, a level designer will get an almost ready-to-play level composed of temporary models and textures. The last step is finalization. This is the most demanding part of level designer's work, as now he gets the result of the whole development team efforts. He composes the whole location using the given assets. He makes the cases and chests look like cases and chests, puts vases on the tables, lets the sun shine through the trees. Then the content gets into the final cut, it is necessary to freeze it up immediately. From this moment all the content additions to the lever are strictly forbidden as optimization is at the highest priority. At the final stage we customize the render distance, the display quality of the characters, models, special effects and shadows. Now we also erase all the useless assets and other stuff. The finalization stage ends up with tests and bug fixing. Afterward, the production cycle is considered over. During the development cycle, the game can change significantly, both in technology and in gameplay. All the parts of the workflow are seldom ready at the same time. Some tasks are faster to do, others take more time. A level designer in these circumstances must be always ready to do up-to-date corrections and fix new bugs. Gray box is the best step for these corrections, as the bold and primitive shapes are easy to change, move or erase. And while the late stage corrections are possible, they are much more expensive and difficult. Sometimes a simple change of a character's route requires creating new models and recording new lines of dialogue. That's why those designers who can recognize a potential weak spot and fix it as early as possible are in especially high demand. For example, the team of Naughty Dog had a lot of ideas they wanted to implement in Uncharted 4. The most interesting one was an idea of an interactive grappling hook, which was intended to spice up the exploration of the location. Getting over the rifts was originally designed as a result of three different actions. To take the hook, to spin it, and finally to hook the chosen ledge. It was going to be pretty hard, but interesting at the same time. 
The hook mechanics looked great on paper, but turned out impossible to implement. After the grey box tests, level designer Emilia Schatz figured out that the mechanics were too clumsy, spoiled the gameplay experience and could irritate the players. Finally, Bruce Straley, the game director of Uncharted 4, decided to simplify these mechanics. So now, to use the grappling hook, you need to push only one button. And now let's take a look at the example of a problem popped up in the almost final stage of the level design. In Frozen Flame, right in the middle of the location, we can find a group of rocks. But could you imagine that they appeared here as a fix made on a so-called late blockout stage? That's actually a patch that fixes the particular problems of the particular location. Flat locations cannot tell a story or shape the gameplay. They don't help designers to affect gamers' emotions or to divide the gameplay into zones. Making these rocks led to more global changes in routes of the NPCs, making new models and drawing new textures. But it was an absolutely right decision. The rocks broke the skyline and we got well-defined gameplay zones. The new element of the location made the forest more accented, added a few rifts and spiced up a boring flat area. A world like this inspires players to explore it and make them feel like pioneers. For example, here we have mysterious huge pillars hidden behind the rocks. In the first build of the game, a player would just walk straight to them without exploration of the location, while now the player gets a bright new adventure, attentively planning his own path. This video is based upon the Mikhail Kadikov's blog and the information given by level designer Denis Kuandikov. This video was made by Yuri Kulagin, Daria Kulagina Kravchuk, Denis Kuandikov, Alexey Lutsai and Nikita Volkovich. Lots of people in it. See you around. Bye.